Hi, and welcome to the Graduate Open House. The first session today is an MFA in photography. Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll start with some introductions. My name is Molly Pettengill, I'm Associate Director for Graduate Recruitment. I also hold my MFA in painting. And we have Steve Smith, photog a photography professor and graduate program director with us as well. And we're gonna dive right in. You can also ongoing graduate seminar. The graduate critique is where students show their work on an ongoing basis, probably about three times a semester, and then also final critique. And the graduate seminar is where there are lectures, readings, um, and sometimes you know field trips to exhibitions and shows. Uh, one of the things that I think is also really great about our program is that all of our photo students have uh, their own individual studio. Um, so there's a main photo building, which is, you know, kind of on the main RISD campus. And then there's a graduate building called Fletcher, the Fletcher Studios. And they're about three or four blocks away in the middle of downtown Providence. Mm -hmm. And they're really awesome because each student has their own individual space. Sometimes they, you know, share a large studio, two people to a studio. But a lot of amazing things happen in those studios. You get to rub shoulders with your other photo um, graduate students. And, uh, and to me, that's actually one of the great things about this particular program um, is we actually recruit a lot of intelligent, uh, you know, awesome students and a lot of uh, learning that doesn't kind of show up on any websites or any charts like happens when you're rubbing shoulders with, you know, intelligent peers. And, and that also extends at the Fletcher Studios to the painting department, the sculpture department, the glass department, printmaking department, et cetera. So there's a real lively graduate life and world in the Fletcher Studios. There's also larger critique spaces. There's some making spaces. And we have a lot of making spaces for uh, graduate students um, um, across town in the design center, which is where most of the undergraduate photography is, um, is housed and where most of the classrooms are. There's also large making studios there. So the graduate students kind of split their time between those two places, but they also have this other kind of wonderful um, graduate home, if you will. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's like a lot of our programs. It depends what your interests are. So let's say you need a laser cutter, like we have places like Callworks, which actually is in the first uh, first floor of the, um, the Fletcher building. So the access there is pretty nice, especially if you want to sign on for an internship, which a lot of students do just to get like primo access to all of the different kinds of things that they have. And um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind throwing in the, the link to CoWorks, um, there's a full list there. But I just gave you a link to the curriculum and the um, spaces and the tools. Um, I'm looking right now for a campus map just so you can understand like, yes, things are separated, but they're really, really close. Like, yeah, we're not talking Boston. <laughs> we're not talking New York. We're talking like small town city. Everything's very walkable and bikeable here. And one of the lesser known facts is that with your RISD ID, you get free access to RIPTA, which is our bus system. Um, not always quite on time, but it does go anywhere in the state. <laughs> Would you agree, Steve? I ride it a lot, and uh, it's really good on some routes, and then others are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Questionable. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know what? Some are just more busy. You know, we have eight major colleges in this area. So um, there's no shortage of folks trying to get to school on time. Yeah. Right. Um, so can you talk about, I know students ask me a lot, well, what about like dark room, the photo page, like what kind of uh, materials and equipment do the students have access to? Do they have to sort of fight other majors to get access to that? Can you talk okay. a little bit about that? All right, so that, that's a really great question. And one of the things that I, I wanted to throw out there, um, a lot of people when they're looking for different graduate schools, certain schools sort of have a certain style and a certain look uh, about you know their faculty, their student work, the work that comes in and goes out of that place. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on here at RISD in the photography department as a faculty is not having a specific look. We're actually interested in um, accepting students with different levels of ability and, and also different interests. And so we're actually trying to create uh, work diversity uh, amongst our students as, as we uh, accept uh, our graduate students. And we, we think that's a really awesome way to go because I think, again, the students learn more 
And then um, for students who come in with all kinds of different abilities as well as different interests, we actually have the ability to try and customize within certain degree, you know, your academic path through the RISD graduate program. You have a certain number of elect electives and um, we're, we are like really good at trying to get people access to everything in the department, but also uh, everything outside the department as much as we can. So if someone's got an interest in landscape architecture or sculpture or whatever the case may be, we really try to go out of our way to make sure that those students can get access to those types of classes early. Now, it's not always easy to do that. It really depends on the class. But you, once you are accepted here, you'll meet with the grad program director and also the department head, and we'll start customizing a curriculum uh, for you for the first three semesters. Um, in terms of our equipment, um, we're getting more and better equipment all the time. I think we actually have really quite good equipment. We have a number of, oh, well, I'd say maybe half a dozen, maybe maybe 10 medium format digital cameras that are really great. We've got over um, probably around 16 really quite wonderful wooden um, articulate four by five cameras. They're really quite mm. good. Um, we have a handful of assorted other medium format film cameras and also uh, top of the line DSLRs, which we're getting more and more of. We have a very mm. nice lighting studio. Um, depending on the graduates interests, we also could have individual dark rooms uh, on the fifth floor of the design center that you can have access to. There's also a automated semi automated film uh, developing machine. And um, the grad students also have their own work area in the design center. It is a large format printer that is reserved exclusively for the grad students. Now, if there's also uh, congestion or uh, there's deadlines and starts, you know, the, the room starts backing up in terms of being booked, we also have another room that we reserve for the uh, seniors, which the grad students can have access to. Uh, that, and there's also, I think, maybe like 10 other medium format printers throughout the facility that basically everyone could get access to. We have mm -hmm. uh, two really top of the line um, Hasselblad scanners, as well as a scanning setup using uh, the new Fuji uh, GFX 100S. Um, so we're actually scanning uh, film negatives with, with the camera and it's looking beautiful. So we have a fair amount of access. We also have a lot of portable lighting um, and we have a lighting studio. And I'm trying to think of other things. Um, There's the media, the media resource center too. Did, I don't know right, if you mentioned that. Right. So, so that's so like we, sort of... we don't have it. Um, there's also a large media resource center at RISD, and students can check things out for two, three, four days. I guess sometimes a week. One of the things we do with our grad students uh, over winter break, uh, sometimes our grad students will do an independent study uh, project where they'll actually travel somewhere to to make their work, and uh, we have a reservation system that gives priority to our grad students, they all get first pick of the top of the line gear and they can check it out for the entire winter session or the winter break and also the small mini winter session that we have. Mm -hmm. First year students also can check out a lot of gear between their first year and the second year. So as you're launched into that summer after your first year, you can really load up. And if you're traveling or if you're local, uh, you can check out the gear for the whole summer. So we're really, really doing our best to facilitate students making work mm -hmm. uh, with gear and also with our spaces. And students have access to their studio all over summer break too, right? Right, so they get 24 yeah. seven access to their studio and then they have access for all the breaks, yeah. Amazing, cool. Yeah, yeah and I think some students will take advantage of travel. Others think of it more like, this is my two years, this is my residency and I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna take everything I can out of these resources. Um, which, by the way, I just put in a link to all the resources, including the library, the museum, the, re the um, color lab, which is a newer um, addition, uh, co-works, of course, and then the spatial audio studio. I mean, there's just there's a lot I think you get at a private small school that um, we're all sort of here for the idea of exploration and making and research, whereas um, other schools would not allow you to put silk or ceramics in a laser cutter, <laughs> right? So I, yeah. I love that example of like sort yeah. of how we're able to sort of use the equipment 
to further and progress our, our work and material exploration. So um, we do have a couple of questions and this is my next one that I was gonna tee up, but they already asked it. Um, what is the average MFA photography class size each year, Steve? And um, how many faculty and teachers are there for the photo department? And can you give you a little information about the darkroom facility? So let's start with the first one. What is the class size each year? So we're doing a pretty good job of trying to select seven students each year. So we have a rotation of um, seven students each year uh, within the two years in a given academic year. That means we have 14 students. And so during the course of a grad student's time here, you know, they'll have um, 14 other students uh, in their classes, like their incoming first year class. That second year class will be, you know, uh, some of their peers. So it's it's a pretty nice number. We find that it uh, keeps things um, cozy, but not too uh, not too close. Um, and right now, I think we've got one class that's got six and one class that's got eight. But basically, it's like seven per year. Yeah. And how many faculty or instructors do you have, like full time um, adjuncts, cr uh, guest critics? I think that's, so we, a, that's a really good part, part of the question, too. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think we have um, four full-time faculty at the moment, and uh, we recently hired um, Nandita Rahman, uh, and she is um, dealing with a family situation, but hopefully she'll be joining us in the fall next year. So she is a really awesome artist, and she could potentially be joining the grad program. One of the things that we like to do as faculty members is we also like to have a rotation of the uh, full-time faculty in the graduate critique. The way the graduate critique is run is usually grad program director, which is me this semester, sort of manages things, runs the critique and also the thesis uh, uh, program. And then we're also joined by another full-time critic. So there's always at least two full-time critics in the critique. Uh, we'll often uh, bring in visiting artists and also visiting critics. So each semester we have, um, we have three visiting uh, lecturers, artists from outside, and th those people usually come and do individual crits, while the main crit is happening um, with our with our regular crit cohort. And so each uh -huh. each one of those students, we bring in artists that hopefully you know have something very specific to add. You know, to uh, the three, we divide up the class into three segments, and we bring in artists that can hopefully help them the most. So. Uh -huh. There's three per semester, and then also at the end, we usually have two, uh, at least two invited critics mm -hmm. from outside to uh, bring fresh eyes to the final critique each semester. And so so that's, a, a we try to have a nice uh, amount of steady voices and also a nice mm -hmm. amount of uh, outside voices. The other thing we really encourage our students to do too is to reach out to other students and also other faculty within larger RISD community. We say, you mm -hmm. have a studio you should be scheduling studio visits. And so we encourage everyone to kind of make as many uh -huh. individual critiques happen as possible. You know, what's funny is Dave is I feel like grad school is oftentimes, um, oftentimes they come in thinking that they're going to like, this is just the big, this is like, because the, the uh, thesis is the end. Right. But it's really just the beginning. And it's a lot of what you make of it and how much opportunity you have through RISD, inviting alumni for a studio visit, inviting gallerists for a studio visit where they can see and where you're really producing the most work you probably will yeah. um, until, you know, later on in life. So, yeah. So, I mean, th that is such a, a big piece of it is that, you know, you taking the initiative to say, well, I really need to work with fibers now. So who do I contact? So uh, that's a really, really good point. Um, so information on the darkroom facilities. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the individual darkrooms that our grads are given, um, the ones who are really committed to uh, developing their film, um, are a little bit on the small side, but there's a large uh, group darkroom that's reserved just for grads and majors uh, across the hall. It's largely a black and white darkroom, um, but we're committed to the black and white darkroom and committed to film. Students are processing their own black and white film as well as their own color film. And um, we do have a, a, a large uh, darkroom on the floor below as well. So I think there's plenty of space for, mm -hmm. for our darkrooms. And we believe that we are 
you know, the keepers of the dark room, if you will, is kind of a cheesy way to say it. But our students also are kind of, you know, driving, you know, the the tools that, that we use. Like most of our students are right. go through a period of shooting film as well as shooting digital and uh, printing in the dark room as well as printing digitally. Mm -hmm. so, and that and that's so important is like, you know, I think a lot of schools are getting rid of like color dark rooms because they're just not needed anymore. There's more technology out there, right? And so yeah awesome um let's go to the next question because they're starting to come in now um how does the program prepare the students for a thesis in the grad show okay that's a great idea so um a great question rather we try and set up a very loose uh, schedule for students to kind of uh, direct their studio work and the first semester that you come we're asking you to experiment um uh, as much as possible. Uh, like if you've got ideas that you're bringing to RISD, we encourage you to kind of keep expanding them, but we also encourage you to take advantage of the place to see what other you know, directions that your work might take you. We encourage the incoming students in their second semester to keep experimenting as well. Maybe you know, start to define something that uh, they're a little bit more particularly interested by the end of second semester, and then focus on that over the summer. We really try and uh, set students up so that that summer in between first and second year is like a prime digesting as well as making period. The final fall semester, um, students can still do a little bit of experimenting, but we're going to ask you by the end of fall semester, second year to start, you know, figuring out, you know, one of the bodies of work or one element of the body of work and figure out how to take it to a more completed stage. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Our students have the option of writing a thesis paper. We're also making a thesis book, which is you know part artist monograph and also part thesis paper. And depending on the student's goals, like how academic they want to have their thesis paper be, or you know, if there's a way for them to combine the thesis paper with you know like an artist uh, book or a photo mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. uh, kind of directs their path, you know, for the last semester, winter session and also mm -hmm. um, the final semester. We have um, graduate seminar is there to kind of get people, um, you know, up to date and, you know, well read, as well as kind of help facilitate different directions they might want to explore with their making. And then um, in the final semester, we actually have a thesis writing class. There's also other writing classes that kind of, you know, encourage students to explore their own creativity, like uh, and West class, the mapping of one's own work, uh, which is an mm -hmm. awesome class that a lot of grads and, and our grads take. And a lot of them find that really, really helpful. A uh, great way to sort mm -hmm. of expand their writing skills without, you know, a lot of stress. And, and it also in a way that really pushes their, their studio work. So yeah. yeah, each one of the there's semesters, there's a little bit of a, mm, you know, box that we like people to think about checking. Um, mm -hmm. But the final semester is usually dedicated to finishing up the studio project and writing the thesis paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sarah, would you mind putting in the 2022 museum publication of all of the uh, the online thesis? Because what happened with the pandemic was actually kind of silver lining. We have an in-person show, which is like amazing. You, you feel the excitement, we, we can invite galleries, we can invite curators, we can invite people to come and, and get that exposure that you need. But having that publication on the side almost functions as an archive for you to go back and look to see who has graduated. Um, and it will show you what Steve was talking about earlier is that there is no one sort of prescription to, to what we do here. And, um, and another person that I was thinking about, Steve, that might be a really good example of how their thesis work becomes the catalyst for what they do after is uh, Ramel. So I don't yeah. know if Ramel has his own website. Um, I actually think there's a story about him on RISD. Let me see if I can find it. Um, and as I do that, let me ask the next question first. How common sure. is it for someone to get into the program and then see the direction of their work radically change? Um, it happens. Uh, I don't know what kind of percentage I'd throw at it, but I would say, you know, <laughs> 10, 20%. Um, and we're actually, you know, really happy to try and facilitate that. One of the things about people experimenting with their work is like if 
uh, the current faculty maybe isn't aligned for you to best make the to make the best use of RISD, you know, we will actually direct you to other people within the department or other people, you know, outside the department. Uh, one of the things we also have with our thesis uh, papers is we have our students choose and um, manage their own thesis committee. And part of, um, you know, having a thesis committee is being able to kind of have like direct one-on-one -on -one contact with people uh, inside and also outside of the, um, um, of the uh, RISD uh, faculty. So people often mm -hmm. get artists from Boston or, or New York and, uh, they meet with them twice a semester, once individually, once as a group. They'll be able to advise, you know, the making of work, and also they'll, you know, contribute to feedback on the on the thesis paper. Mm -hmm. um, but and um, can I just add re really quick about the thesis? You know, I think that there's this idea that there is a standard thesis. Um, right. I was there at Ramel's cr final critique where he read out loud his thesis book. And it was a really eye-opening experience because it wasn't um, it wasn't your traditional thesis paper or book, rather. It was a stream of consciousness, which yeah, it was more really like a poem a it was more thing. like a poem, yeah. right? And yeah. you could really see if you watch the movies and the or the films that he's made now, you can see the direct connection. And so I just put a link to that. Check out his. Um, his uh uh her, his film too which you can you know buy on youtube or wherever um the hill county this morning this evening it's absolutely fabulous it's um, yeah. and it gives you a really good idea of like what is possible in like the world in which you hear photo right yeah. but but there's so much more to it and so that's what makes me really excited about his work and just the yeah. possibilities he, he came in making, you know, somewhat straightforward work and then kind of immediately through lots of influences here at RISD, both in the film department and also the poetry department, really changed his work into film and uh, really beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah, so. absolutely gorgeous. Um, all right. So how common is it for someone to get into the program? We just asked that one. Number. I'm sorry. Let me track here. Good morning, thank you for this session. I live in Providence and have a full-time job. I understand the program is based on critique sessions. How many times a week are these sessions held? What is the workload like? Is it possible to do this as a full-time worker? Um, yeah, I'll just say no. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, let's not sugarcoat it. I think the reason, and, and the way I say it, Steve, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are putting so much energy, effort, and we're talking about financial effort mm -hmm. into this education. You only get two years and then they're done, you yep. know? And so I think that if you're working part-time, you do you, but, but full-time, it really is like taking away from your education. I think for this student that's asking this question, it might be a better situation to find a program that's part time to find a program that's potentially low residency because we are full time on campus and extremely immersive. And I think that that's what makes really great, great students and great outcomes for our students. Yeah, right? I mean, this is this is the kind of place you want to go to when your work is at a point where you really want to get it better and you also have the time to do that. Yeah, one of the things Timing that is so important. I will advise my students not to take more than one part-time job when they're on campus because basically they're mm -hmm. like paying mm -hmm. to uh, take this really expensive um, education. Yeah. yeah, if you really want to go like like how much am I getting paid and how much am I paying for RISD, it just doesn't. You know, there are ways to fund your education here, and I'll just name a few yep. fellowships. They are given at the time of admission. They're based on merit and financial need. And that's large chunks of change. We're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, even 100% tuition discounts. Because we do have now the Society of Presidential Fellows, which is an entire tuition waiver, okay? Extremely competitive, but you don't know unless you apply. Secondly, we have assistantships. And assistantships are ways to earn funds, but also gain experience, whether that be a teaching assistant, a research assistant, working for the museum. All of these positions, again, are very competitive. It does depend on your own resume and your own work um, history. 
And then the third thing is that we've developed a, uh, um, a social equity and inclusion fund. And what these funds do is they try to create an equitable experience um, regardless of your financial circumstances. Almost all grads are in the same financial circumstances. We've been working and now we're not, or we haven't been working and we're still not working. So I think that uh, those kinds of things, and those are funds for materials, for internships, which are mostly unpaid, for travel abroad opportunities to really give you the full experience. So I think a little bit more research is is um, needed on your part, but we're happy to help you. Um, this was from Bruno. Bruno, get in touch with me if you need any help. We're gonna we're gonna put the email at the end. Okay, moving right along. Okay, Sarah, you want to answer this one? Oh, sorry, I just meant to put that it was gonna be answered live. I don't need to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, what is the day-to-day -day experience like for a grad student in the program? What do we expect? Well, that's a great question. Um, so we try and get students not to take too many classes each semester, and we actually ask them to um, set aside a certain amount of time each week to be making work, uh, whether that's shooting or making video or sculpting or whatever the case may be. We really try and get students to set aside time because one of the problems with this place is there's so much going on. You know, the lectures, all the different departments, there's brown just up the hill. You know, one could be like soaking in, you know, this amazingly rich environment all the time. So we try and get students to think about their academic schedule as well as their making schedule. And students mm -hmm. typically will go to class two, maybe three days a week, depending on what, what's going on. And then they might have a few lectures uh, in the evenings uh, every week uh, or every other week. Um, and then basically a lot of our students just kind of live at their studios when they're not either in class or at home. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, there are. There are a lot of opportunities on the periphery of just your coursework and your studio work. You know, um, I think Brown University is one of those big ones. Um, we've had students from sculpture gain access to um, a, a nuclear facility in um, Geneva. And we've had students <laughs> go to um, pursue uh, fellowships programs where they were part of a fellowship program. Um, a student from ID looking at the uh, um, the all these words are escaping me now, but the cadence of the sun and the so light cycles, and he became a sort of a data visualization um, fellow for Brown University while a graduate graduate student here, but it fed into his thesis, right? So there are ways to like kind of make that work. There's a lot of cross pollination between the faculty and the students and the community. Um, and of course you can cross register for classes there if there's something really targeted um, that we don't offer um, that is part of your work. So I think that's a great opportunity. Yeah, we're really good at getting our students in Brown classes and not letting Brown students in our classes. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't have as much room. We have quite a bit more room. I know, and, and that's the thing. They have a very large campus. You have access mm -hmm. to their facilities too, their libraries, their labs, you know, like, they're amazing sports facilities if you um, play sports. We do have some intramural sports. We have our first rowing team, I found out. How cool is that? Um, but, uh, you know, there's just a lot of opportunities there. And just in the fact that we have a lot of young professionals and a lot of, of college students in the area. So, yeah. all right. So let's go on to the next question. We have a couple left here. Um, when do you find out if you've gotten in and when do you find out what kind of financial aid um you will you you've been offered um so you will know when you're accepted and you will know your financial aid within a few weeks so we typically have this unofficial acceptance where maybe you got an interview by steve he gives you a call a week later and he says hey you're in We'd love to have you here. And then official uh, decisions go out within the first week of March. And that includes your official acceptance letter that comes from us in admissions, along with all of your financial aid um, offers. And you'll know right then and there. Um, you know, I think that the best 
possible thing you can do, especially with a program like photography. Um, you know, we are looking at this holistically, but the portfolio really is the most important part of the port of the um, application. And that's really how we're looking at students, what perspective you're coming from visually, um, the, ty the, the type of work that you're making. You know, I, I always try to use um, the example as a painter, I, I have to use painting examples, of course. If I'm in a room full of abstract painters, I'm not gonna gain a different perspective if I'm also an abstract painter, right? I, I sort of need these different um, perspectives to be able to push me, to be able to progress in my work, right? So maybe some performance, maybe there's some people working with film, maybe there's some people working with documentary style work, you know? I think, um, and, I, and the turnaround time can be a little tricky because the deadline is January uh, 5th, so that's quickly approaching. And then you just have to kind of sit and wait <laughs> until you hear from us um, and uh, until until March. So, so there's a little bit of waiting time, but uh, we're pretty much in line with all of the other major graduate programs that you are likely applying to. We're right in line with their deadlines. We're right in line with their um, decision release times. And that's been well-researched, so. Yeah. Well, that's a good question one, though. One little bit, if I could. Um, yeah. So we're still using slide room for the applications, yes? The work? Mm -hmm. Well, just yes, for the work, just for the work. Just for the work. So one of the things that I think uh, students could do to improve the visibility and understandability of their work is there's a little space for comments on each slide in slide room. And photographers, sometimes they get a little obsessed with the technical stuff. And we see people putting their f-stop and their shutter speed or the process that they're using. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I think that's fine. But what I would also encourage people to do is we're looking at a lot of work very quickly. And I would actually like do this thing that's horribly uncomfortable. And I would tell us, the committee looking at your work, how to look at your work. It'll let us know like what you're thinking. And if the work's like pretty good and we see potential, this could be a great thing to kind of help us see more potential. So mm -hmm. that is a great opportunity to use. And then um, Molly can correct me if I'm speaking out of turn, but one of the things that we encourage our students to do instead of visiting campus, I mean, you can visit campus whenever you is convenient for you, but we often will select uh, maybe 14 or 16 finalists. Um, and then we encourage those students after they've been selected to visit campus and participate in critique. We can't really give people feedback on their work until they've been accepted as students. But if you want to get a firsthand uh, view, uh, mm -hmm. We think it's actually really important that people come and visit mm -hmm. campus. And at that point, you would actually be able to sit in on critiques, at least in our department. COVID, right, and that would be COVID facilitated permitting. by that would be facilitated by your your department, your our department coordinator. Department. We would, we right. Would be so essentially, yeah. So invitation. essentially, if you contact us in admissions, we're going to say we don't have grad tours because uh, we're just a really small team and we don't have the bandwidth to do it. And the undergrad tour doesn't give you too much, so. We typically send you over to um, the department, especially in the time of like when decisions go out. Um, but you know, we're we're pretty good at facilitating that. We'll send you where you need to be. So yeah, that's that's a good point. You got to know where you're going to be. I mean, Providence is not like Boston or New York. You know, you have access to those places. It's just very quaint, but I think very special place. Yeah. Um, and I've heard like a lot of students that when they come visit, they're like, I fall in love with this city, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's an important piece. Um, okay, so next question. There is a summer professional internship course list. Could you provide more information? I don't think that might not be through the, pro, for, th through the department, but I think that might be through careers. So what I'd love Sarah to do is just put in a link to the career session, just the direct link right to sign up to for careers. They have so many connections for internships yeah. over the summer. It's not so. Um, and not only that, but they, in, in some cases, they're funding it for you, yeah. right? So um, attend that session. I was just checking the numbers right now. There's only 10 people signed up for the career center. This is like, I remember going to the Career Arts Center. I went to UMass Amherst for my BFA. Like, okay, what do I do next? And they're like, you're an art student. You don't know. You know? And here it's like, <laughs> this is what we do. Yeah. This is what we do. We have all the big names, all the local names, all the lo local organizations. What kind of, what kind of 
Um, Abony, do you want to go into? Do you want to go into nonprofit? Do you want to go into community activism? Like, where do you want to be? Um, and they have so many connections. They do one-on-one -on -one appointments. And grad students, you have access to all of that. Um, undergrads, you have to wait until your junior year. So you guys just have special access to that. Um, you know, even, even if it's as simple as like, okay, you applied with this CV, now let, bring it to us. We're going to ramp it up for you. We're going to make it look real good because we know what these companies are looking for. Yeah. And the companies that come back and recruit RISD students are RISD owned companies because they're alumni from RISD. So, <laughs> you know, it's this wonderful, wonderful relationship with the Career Center. So I encourage every single one of you to sign up for that session if you can. And also just to note, this session, along with the career session, everything's going to be recorded and it will be sent back to you um, uh, via email. So check your emails from RISD, not over yet. So I'm so glad you asked that question because the Career Center one is one of my favorite presentations. No offense, Steve. No, uh, they're, they're awesome. They really they're incredible. Like the stuff they're incredible. Down pipe. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we have two more questions and I think um, that's going to be it for today. We do have a session starting right at 10 o'clock. So we're going to jump off of this one into the next one. Um, so let's get these ones going. Can you talk a little bit about the application review process? How are the applications considered? Who looks at them? And what are the, how are the essays considered along alongside the work? And what do you most look for within the statement? So maybe we can talk about the review process, Steve, mm -hmm. but also talk about um, the difference between a statement of purpose and an artist artist statement, because that's I think the big. One yeah, of the that's a really that's a really good point. So I think the work is is one of the most you know important elements of that whole process, obviously. And um, one of the things I think students sometimes do is maybe they'll put too many bodies of work. Uh, I always tell students, like, <clears throat> just put your strongest work in there. If you don't have 20 slides and 18 looks really strong, put 18. Uh, if it's two bodies of work and it's 18, awesome. If it's like 20 slides and there's 20 different types of work, that doesn't really help very much. Um, so I try no. and get limited to at least, you know, the, you know, no more than two bodies of work. And I would tell us what to think about the work in those statements. And then I would also tell us what to think about the work in the artist statement. I mean, when you're writing your artist statement, you are the expert. And so um, people try and be smart and, you know, not expose too much of themselves. And the people that do very well are people who just actually say, this is what I'm interested in. This is how I'm approaching it. So um, the artist statement is a little bit more formal. Um, the statement of purpose is very helpful because it lets us know where you are in your life and how you're approaching graduate school. So that's a lot of important information that we use to, uh, you know, uh -huh. to, yeah, to kind of help people, you know, fit in the, the cohort. Everyone, uh -huh. everybody's work is looked at. Um, we go through a jury process. There's some people that kind of don't understand what they're applying for. And sometimes we'll weed those out. Uh, initially, but we actually show the work to all full-time full all full-time photo faculty and also all the graduate students. We try and get the graduate students involved and get their feedback. We feel it's really important in forming a, you know, not necessarily a cohesive group, but a group that can can work together, you know, in the mm -hmm. following year. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we will select probably 14 to 16 finalists. And we'll do interviews via Zoom. And we'll also invite those people to visit campus. And after the people who've had the opportunity to visit campus and also do the, the full um, the Zoom interview, we then start making our final selection process. So um, it's kind of a two, maybe three tiered uh, step process. But uh, mm -hmm. the Zoom interview is really important. But mm -hmm. I would also say that you know, that personal statement about your work is, is like really, really helpful. So we're actually yeah, really it, people whose work is about to like really do something and, you know, take a big step. And if you can get that across in your application materials, then, you know, we, we put a lot of interest in that. Yeah. And, and the one thing that I see most often, Steve, and this is a piece of advice to everybody here, have, make sure your artist statement is referring to the work that you're showing. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> because I think sometimes there's a big disconnect, and it's like, mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I've done in the past, but like it doesn't even mention the work that you actually are showing us. 
right? So make sure that those two things are, are related in some way. Um, and also with your um, statement of purpose, what is your purpose? Why do you need graduate study? Why now? Why is now the time? And then most importantly, why RISD? I can't tell you how many times you see a statement of purpose that says, this is why I'm applying to Micah. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, and it's like, that's fine, you get it, but like mm. read it over and over again. You got lots of applications going, and sometimes you're sort of blind to it. Have folks, I don't care if it's your family member um, or a friend that knows how to write, like just have people take a look at it. Um, it really makes a really big difference. So um, one of the things that can really help you do with your portfolio, and then we'll we'll go ahead and um, we'll end it after this. Uh, Sarah just posted a link. Oh, Sarah, I think you just posted to the host and panelists. So I'm just going to copy and paste it here. Um, is that in December, we have a portfolio review. There are limited spots left. This is a great way to find out, should you show 12 pieces uh, and not just throw in some random, I've done printmaking and I've done, you know, some still life trying and it, it's not relevant to what you want to do at the graduate level. So we're going to tell you um, maybe what to exclude, what to include. Oh, this is interesting. Do you have more on that? Right. So it's a conversation. It's about um, 10 minutes long with myself or with a bunch of alumni that come and help us do this and faculty as well. It's a great way to get your portfolio ready to um, submit. So if there are any spaces left, go ahead and do that. And again, I just want to post the link to the Career Center because this is like the premier event. Um, it is incredible. It's like, why do people come to RISD? Because we have an amazing alumni group. We have an amazing group of uh, opportunities through the Career Center, the museum, the faculty, the students, everything. It's just incredible. So. Um, the last couple questions here is about composite images, which I think is important. And then there's another one. I don't know if we can get to all of them, but so I'm just going to run through really quickly, Steve, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, uh, do, do you tend to admit more students uh, with a BFA versus not a BFA? Um, there's no average range of like how many people with a BFA and how many people who don't, but can you speak to that? We, we're, we're interested in people who don't have BFAs. And in fact, sometimes they are quite a bit more interesting because they're maybe their learning curve is a little bit steeper with the medium, but they bring mm -hmm. a certain a different kind of breadth to their approach. Yes. They're not as cookie cutter, right? And so I find that too, especially in places like architecture where you're like A plus B equals C, right? Mm -hmm. And so here we have people coming from literary backgrounds, performance backgrounds, yes. um, yeah. all runs the gamut. Um, so the portfolio day, we'll tell you what, how yep. to do that. Um, okay. So last and final question, and then we're going to have to, um, sign off here, but again, it's recorded, um, and it'll be up on YouTube. We'll have our own open house channel. So stay tuned. You'll get an email about that. What is the effect of Im images in combination? So composite images, can I put three or four photos in one, one single upload? Um, sure. So, um, if you're doing series or something, you know, that's not really explained just by the picture itself, put together some text in the side little comment section in slide room. Tell us this is a series, you know, this is a, a part of an mm -hmm. ongoing series, or these are three yeah. segments in this larger series. That really helps us when we're looking at the work. So I think that there's a really big difference though, and I just want to clarify this. If you're trying to show us everything you've ever done and smush it onto one page, you're doing yourself a disservice because yeah. we can only zoom in a certain amount, right? However, if the work is meant to be seen in four blocks and maybe it's um, an abstraction, maybe maybe they feed, feed into one another in a way, that is intentional, right? Versus trying to show us everything and try to fit it all in within the 20 slides that you get. Yeah, so I would call, call one like an installation piece. So call, you know, if you're zooming in, call those details of, and then also include like, you know, how the piece fits on the wall or in the space. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Steve, for taking the time out of your morning My pleasure. to spend with us today. And um, if you're all right with it, um, if anybody does have questions, you can email us at admissions at rosie.edu. And if it is a Steve question, I will send it over to Steve, the graduate program director. Um, but I will vet those, Steve, so that you're not answering questions like when's the deadline. So don't okay. don't worry about all that. Right. <laughs> all, all right. right. So you. let me go ahead and put that in. Thank you again, Steve. You guys have a wonderful day. Here is the email. And we're off. Bye-bye. Thank you.